lecture of the UWF Downtown series. I'm Jane Hallen, and I'm proud to be the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. We're here tonight in part because of, of the generosity and wisdom of a donor who said, we do a great job in the town, thanks to some people we know, in science, but we want to make sure that <clears throat> the other aspects of liberal arts education do not get lost in the emphasis on STEM, science, technology, education, or engineering, and math. And so what can we do that will help accomplish a couple goals? To highlight the talent that we have at UWF, which is considerable among the faculty, uh, to create deeper relationships with the town, and to figure out a way to get students and community people to mix. Now, I just want to prove a point. Students, would you stand up? Thank you all for coming, and those who are in my class, special favors later. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, invite you to the other uh, lectures that we'll have in the series. In November, Jocelyn Evans, who's a, a government faculty person, will be helping us make sense of whatever happens in November in the election. Uh, we also will have a session at Pensacola Little Theater, um, led by Glenn Breed, a brilliant costumer that will help give us insights into the theater. Our lecture series will finish this year with an external speaker, the U.S. Poet Laureate Natasha Trethaway. And that event will be right back here in this room, so we expect you all to return for that. Now, having said that, we are so grateful to see so many friends in the community and supporters of UWF. If you're a supporter of UWF, would you raise your hand, please? Okay, we just wanted to give Judy that special push. And uh, now I'd like to introduce Ken Ford, who has the serious job of introducing Judy Benz. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to see so many of you here, and I see a lot of friends in attendance. Uh, please, uh, let's take a minute to, uh, it won't even take a minute, to ensure our cell phones are set to vibrate or off or stun or whatever your favorite <laughs> setting is. We are very pleased tonight at IHMC to be assisting UWF with the inaugural kickoff of their new liberal arts lecture series that you just heard about. And I think it's a great idea, and in particular, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Judy Bentz tonight. We probably all best know Judy for her local radio program, Unearthing Pensacola, uh, where she fascinated uh, us with uh, our own history, particularly the underwater archaeological finds right offshore. I, I found that particularly interesting myself. But I know Judy Bentz as a fellow faculty member at UWF. Together, at the time, we were both uh, building institutes, uh, she in archaeology and me at IHMC. Dr. Bentz, uh, having served UWF for 30 years, became the fifth president of the university on July 1, 2008. Since being appointed president, Judy has focused on growth, visibility, and partnerships with the noble goal of making UWF a first-choice school. She has built a solid network of community partners, identified regional workforce needs, and strengthened academic programs so that students are prepared for future leadership roles here and around the nation. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Judy Bentz. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming tonight. I see a a very mixed audience of uh, old friends who helped me get started, uh, students who have graduated and now are making their living in archaeology uh, here in Pensacola and doing well, um, neighbors, faculty friends, my former boss, Jane Hallinan, uh, and uh, uh, friends of the university and uh, our trustee, Vice Chair Lewis Baer of our Board of Trustees. And um, it's an interesting mix, but my life has been an interesting mix, especially lately. And um, so I'm, uh, it's my honor to kick off this lecture series. I have a degree in social science, and I'm very proud of it. It is in anthropology, which you will learn about in a second. 
But what I'm going to do is to um, uh, run you through a um, little bit. These are the topics that I'm going to study. Uh, to uh, study. It's been a long day. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll explain to you a presidential day in a little while. Um, but uh, the topics I'm going to talk to you about. Many of you in the room know what archaeology really is. Many of you think you know what it is. And uh, many of you uh, have no clue. And so I'm going to kind of level the playing field a little bit with that. And then uh, I want to give a synopsis of the archaeology story at the University of West Florida just to remind you and to begin to, for, to make the connection of the path of archaeology at UWF and its unique story uh, to uh, the archaeologist, uh, uh, myself, uh, becoming president of the university. Um, then uh, uh, what it meant to be the interim president. And then I want to uh, uh, run over and explain some of the parallels of being uh, growing an archaeology program uh, and it being successful and how what the surprising parallels were uh, to prepare me to be the president. Uh, there are some hard parts, as there are with everything. That's nothing new. And so uh, that's kind of what I'm going to try to do tonight. I, I sat down with this, and, uh, and I, I haven't ever, I've said little bits and pieces of this in various conversations that I've had. Uh, but I'm usually with one or another audience. I'm either with archaeologists uh, at fewer and fewer occasions, uh, but, um, uh, or I'm with the public and people who know me as the president. But uh, now you're all mixed up. Um, I first want to tell those of you who are new to archaeology what it is not. Uh, I'm uh, old enough now to know, uh, to have experienced the first Indiana Jones movie. And at first I was appalled. I was absolutely appalled. I had just begun teaching. And I thought it was terrible because it was everything archaeology really isn't. But what it did do was drive students into archaeology classes. And so I began to really appreciate archaeology. Of course, they learned what archaeology is, which I will share with you. Uh, and on the right is uh, uh, Carter, uh, uh, the archaeologist that discovered Tutankhamun's tomb. Um, uh, part of all of that is true. There are some archaeologists that have guns and whips. Uh, uh, <laughs> Carter did discover uh, Tutankhamun's tomb. And, uh, uh, and so on, but I um, ha hate to tell you that it's, it's really not that. Um, I always wanted to be an archaeologist since I could remember. Uh, I don't know why. I liked history. Uh, my parents drug us around to historical sites for trips and family vacations. Uh, we were of modest means and they were free uh, to visit, so I, we enjoyed it. We had to read every stinking sign. <laughs> And every museum and every exhibit and our mother would not let us go out and play until we did that. And so we visited uh, places like Port St. Joe and Apalachicola and Tallahassee and Mobile and Pensacola. And um, I began to be very fascinated with the past. And I think that uh, this is also what archaeology is not. Uh, the picture on the left is uh, a laborers uh, who dig. And uh, this is the Near East in a tell or a large uh, archaeological mound. And uh, there, in the classical archaeology, uh, there you don't dig, uh, you just supervise. And um, I, that never appealed much to me, um, except on some days. <laughs> and uh, the one on the right is archaeology was only for men. And it was sort of an exotic thing, like going on a safari hunt. It had a lot of class. And during the uh, 19th century, it was um, kind of uh, like going on a safari. And uh, you brought back curios and things from these exotic places that happened to be antiquities. And so archaeologists really um, have enjoyed a special place uh, in society because we really do look backwards into the past. And there are very few disciplines that do. Geology is one. Paleontology is another. Uh, history, of course, is another. But they do look backward. And people are curious about what has happened because everyone is dead. <laughs> and writing has only been around for about 6,000, 7,000, 10,000 years, if you really stretch it. But people have been around for uh, at least half a million years. And uh, we haven't changed, really, physically all that much. But the difference between us and Neanderthals, the difference between us and, and uh, primitive uh, uh, humans is absolutely vast. 
and it really is what we call culture. It's information that we have learned and that we share that is the only difference. We are today no smarter than the people who lived in caves. We're no smarter than the people who were the knights in the Crusades. We're no smarter than the people that lived in the Dark Ages. We have the same range of intelligence, the same brain, but we are very different culturally. Uh, I used to say in my classes to get uh, the attention of students is that we could have sexual intercourse with Neanderthals and have a bouncing baby, American baby, who would grow up to use computers and go to the movies and, and text and cell phone and do all the things that young people do. But to, uh, I say that to give people a perspective on, on, on us in the present because we're a very forward-looking culture. And I'm, that's not neither bad or good, but we are very forward-looking. So that's what archaeology is not. Now I want to tell you what archaeology really is. Uh, archaeology in the United States only is part of anthropology. We have our degrees in anthropology. There, is, there are a few degrees in archaeology in the universities in the United States, but they're very, very few. And uh, they're really more like, um, like uh, historical uh, people who do culture history. And, uh, and go past the historical, uh, the, the invention of writing. So, uh, but in the United States, 99.9% .9 of us have a degree in anthropology. And anthropology is a very serious social science. Uh, it, is, um, it, is, it studies uh, something as broad as human culture. It tries to answer the question of who are we? Why are we here? What are we doing? And how does it work? We do not pass culture on genetically. All of you know babies are born knowing nothing. Nothing. They don't know who their mother is. They don't know who their father is. They don't know what language to speak. They don't know how to do anything. We have to teach them all. That is culture. And every culture thinks their way is the right way. That's the only way. And if you had to choose, they'll fight over it. And that is one of the great saving graces of a culture, is that people think it is absolutely wonderful. And it is theirs, and it is no one else's. And so um, anthropologists have taken on the task of explaining how it developed and why, because there were non-cultured beings all over the planet until our ancestors came along. The, uh, uh, and why it has taken the form and the path and the shape that it has taken. And archaeology is just one of the divisions of anthropology that studies culture in the past. Archeo uh, cultural anthropology studies uh, cultures in the present. They study native cultures. Uh, 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 they study cultures with low technology. They study Western culture. They study culture. And we don't do surveys. And we don't do questionnaires. We watch and we participate. And then we make observations and deductions. Because I will hear, I'm here to tell you that nobody really knows what you're doing or why. You don't know what you did this morning exactly. You don't know exactly what you did in your life. You don't know exactly why we drive on the left-hand side of the road. And you really don't care. What you're really trying to do is to get along and succeed and raise your kids and have a good life and, and do all of that. And uh, that, is what, that, that is what humans do. What anthropologists do is take a step back and say, why this way and not that? Why did this change and not that? What are the things about culture that change faster and slower? Is there a rate to them? Can we track it uh, using a, a clock? And the answer is yes and no to, to, uh, to all of those. And really, uh, the, the intellectual question that drives anthropologists is, why are we like we are? Why are we not somewhere else? Why did our brain stop growing? Why did our brain begin to grow? Why did we get up on two feet? What happened to us after that? Why did someone pick up artifacts? How have they affected our lives? And they make us what we are today. The most complicated artifact that we have today is, uh, are the satellites and the space shuttles and the lab, uh, uh, the space lab. And uh, uh, it, is, it works just fine. And actually, I usually tell students in the beginning and the end of courses or lectures that there is nothing that human beings have tried that they have failed at. They just didn't want to do it bad enough. Given the proper incentive, humans can do anything. Anything. I use the crude analogy of if we had found gold on the moon. 
in the 1960s? Don't you think it'd be different? Don't you think we'd be there and don't you think we'd own it? Of course we would. Why are we going into outer space? Our culture is driving us. Why haven't people gone into outer space before? I digress, but I want you to let you know that that's the context of, of what I do and my thoughts and my perspective on everything. It's the anthropological perspective. It is one of relevance. No culture is better than another. They're all different. They all have their story. They all think they're best. And, uh, and it is fascinating to watch us as humans change and go with the flow. Like, why haven't we had World War III? Why did we disarm? One of the things I'm reading about now is the Cold War. We came very, very, very close. But nobody wanted to take the responsibility. Not even the communists, not even the Soviets, not even us. Why don't we have the big war with nuclear weapons? That's an anthropological, cultural question that is absolutely fascinating. Look at the spread of technology with cell phones. I have never seen anything, none of us have, spread this fast. So this is it's a fascinating thing to study. Humans are the most fascinating things on the planet. And, uh, and so that is where we come from. Now, when you get down to archaeology, it is a discipline, a subdiscipline of anthropology, but you can't major in it. You can only specialize in it. In a way, it's a lot like medicine. You have, to get, you have to go to medical school and get your degrees, but then you specialize in something. And that's the way archaeologists are. You can spe doctors can specialize in eye, ear, nose, and throat. They can specialize in radiology or pediatrics or whatever. And uh, so uh, there are four, uh, really three, but four, we count them, linguistics, cultural anthropology, uh, biological anthropology, and archaeology. So uh, that's how it works. Now, um, teams. One of the, the things that, that I learned very quickly is that you never do archaeology alone. It is impossible to do it alone. If you do try to do it alone, you will spend your entire life digging a hole no bigger than this room. And that's no fun, it's unnecessary, and you don't have to dig every square inch. So, but it, uh, we do work in teams. And so getting along together, as many of the students in the room know in archaeology, and who have participated in archaeology, uh, uh, getting along in small groups and small group dynamics is a very important part of being a successful archaeologist. And so early on, the, uh, the really uh, introverts, the people who don't get along with anybody, don't like archaeology, even though they did want to go to Egypt and dig up mummies, but they have to work with these groups of people in the hot summer, and it is not a democracy. It's very hierarchical. Uh, in some ways, it's like the military uh, with levels of authority, and there is a bottom rung. There is boot camp, and uh, you've you got to pass it. Uh, so uh, another thing is that, is that we uh, are a social science, and being a, a social science means that we do generate hypotheses to test. We just don't go out wildly digging to see what's there or dig a site because it is there. We dig a site for a reason. And we have expectations. We have theories we're going to uh, challenge and test. We, we have to operationalize how that will play out on the ground, what we would find if we were right, what we would find if we were wrong. And so it is uh, scientific. But on the other hand, it's cultural. And what cultural really means is that unlike uh, the hard sciences, we don't come out with formulas or theorems or axioms or laws. What we really come out with is probabilities. And that drives people crazy. Because uh, it is a probability. Uh, almost everything is a probability. There are a few laws, um, a cultural laws, uh, but we will call them that. One is change. Humans are, it's impossible for humans to stay the same. If I gave you a million dollars cash right here, and I said, in one year, I want this group of people to come back, and I'll give a million dollars to every person here, and your job is not to change. Don't you be any different. I keep all the money, because you will change. You'll change your language, you'll change your clothes, you'll change your stuff, you'll change your attitudes about something, and that is also the human, uh, human nature. Uh, so, archaeology also has very long-term goals. Uh, uh, but we have very strict deadlines, as anyone who is in any profession has deadlines. Otherwise, we'd never get done. Otherwise, we'd never really start. Uh, and, uh, but it is. But we have long-term goals. We're very used to goals, to starting projects that are years long, sometimes a decade long. 
Uh, I've uh, conducted research that is five years long and 30 years long, uh, but uh, with milestones along the way, of course. So I'm used to, the, we are used to that perspective. It's, um, it's different than, than, than other disciplines, but those of us that are in the, the university and in almost any discipline are very used to uh, the long-term goals. Uh, another thing is very expensive. Archaeology, uh, it's not as expensive as the hard sciences, but it does involve a lot of people. It doesn't involve that much equipment. Uh, and, you know, super, you know, costs a half a million dollars a machine, and you need four of them. We, we don't have too many of those, but it is very expensive. So we're very used to dealing with lots of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, uh, um, uh, half a million dollars. Those are things that we are used to dealing with, uh, and uh, we're used to being responsible for it. I often say uh, when, when uh, someone whines about being, uh, um, you know, why are they making me write this, uh, 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 my, my budget out, and why are they uh, uh, asking me for every dime that I spent? And the answer is, it's their money. And I never mind being accountable for spending someone else's money. And because if they were spending my money, I would want them to be accountable too, to me. And so uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we're used to it. Um, archaeologists are used to dealing with a lot of money, a lot of people, uh, long-term goals, and uh, uh, being, being accountable. Uh, another thing that archaeology is that many of the uh, field sciences, by that I mean like geology or paleontology or environmental studies, were very vulnerable to uh, the weather and other unpredictable things um, and events. Uh, like hurricanes, uh, the wettest summer on record, uh, uh, the fact that this is your only window of time, this is the first time the bay water cleared up and you can see anything, you know, and the motor won't start, uh, or the wind picks up, or whatever it is. And we're very used to being vulnerable. And uh, it's not something that we enjoy, but if you can't deal with it, you're not going to get very far in, in archaeology. Another aspect about archaeologists and archaeology that what it really is, is we very rarely do it, dig up the whole thing, whatever it is. We don't dig up a whole pot. We don't dig up a whole house. We don't dig up a whole tool. We have little tiny bits and fragments. What you see on CSI, on television, is true. We find little tiny traces, little tiny things. Now, I'm not going to tell you I have dug up a whole Indian pot. We have found almost a whole shipwreck, but that's rare. It's very rare. Mostly we find little things, but, uh, and we count every one of them, we catalog every one of them, we put them into the computer, we deal with large databases, and then we seek patterns in the data uh, to tell us uh, uh, what's going on, either through time or across space. So we're used to those perspectives, uh, uh, having uh, to account for and keep track of and have a database that has definitions uh, that are, are hopefully in concrete uh, between archaeologists, between projects, is just annoying as heck. But if you don't do it, and you don't do it right, you will not be able to use the, the, the information that you spend so much time, money, and effort uh, of your life to, to, um, to, to find. So we have millions of artifacts and fragments at the University of West Florida, millions and millions and millions. And they are all accounted for. They all have little numbers. We all have these big databases. We moved right along with computers and mainframes and, uh, and hard drives and servers and cloud computing. Archaeologists have always been right there uh, uh, because of the number of things that we found. Um, I, I will tell you that I went to uh, the university before compu computers. Uh, I did my dissertation with a calculator, and it was, it was not good. Um, uh, I, I made so many mistakes, punching in the numbers, getting the, the columns to add up to the rows and everything adding up, and computers do it uh, so much more accurately, but it is just, we, we just jumped right on them and just, just kept going. And so um, uh, uh, the probability thing. Um, a lot of people get very frustrated with, with social scientists because when we come up with probabilities, uh, they say, no, we don't want a probability. We want to know exactly what the rule is, exactly what the law is. And the answer is there really aren't any. And I know uh, other um, scientists in the room uh, get asked that a lot, too. I see the chair of the math department is here, and he's one of the few who come out with real formulas and real results, predictable, that have, you know, uh, uh, they, they're, they're solid. Uh, Rick Harper and I have a problem with that. We have to say probabilities. And that's okay. It's sure as heck better than nothing. 
Now, a little bit, uh, I wanted to give you more context about archaeology, and that is there are three kinds in the United States. One is academic, the one that I represent and the people here, colleges and universities. I want to tell you, it's only they're almost always in large universities. Archaeology is not something that's done in small universities, except in a very few. Um, the, uh, 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 it is called a second tier uh, uh, discipline. The first tier is like history and math and, uh, and psychology, uh, and then uh, uh, anthropology is second tier. And it's usually at larger schools that have a large enrollment, and a, a few people are interested in it, but enough to uh, support a department. Uh, the other is private consulting firms, and we have uh, uh, the, uh, uh, some private archaeological consultants here in the room uh, 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 the, that make their living here. And uh, we uh, uh, in Pensacola doing archaeology for money. And uh, that's because there are laws in, in the United States that require uh, some archaeological um, um, uh, surveys and testings and excavations before certain uh, projects can, go, can be completed. They're usually government-funded projects, but not always. It's a lot like environmental laws require environmental surveys, archaeological laws. They also bring in archaeological surveys so that you have a new bridge. You don't want to throw out an Indian cemetery in the meantime, and there are laws that, that require archaeologists to look. And then there are government agencies. Uh, there are jobs there. And uh, they, uh, uh, those are the, what I, I casually call the enforcers. They look over all of our shoulders and make sure that the rules and regulations are being enforced. And if they're not, uh, you're told about it, and the client who is building the bridge or the development or whatever uh, is uh, uh, told uh, um, that uh, they need to get a new one or they need to shape up the one they have. So this is the, the world of, of archaeology. So there, uh, that one of the messages I want to get over tonight about archaeology is there are some people in high places in the state that think that uh, degrees in anthropology are useless and that you cannot be employed and uh, that you will starve to death. And the answer is that is incorrect. Uh, we have wonderful stats from our program, and uh, you, can, uh, you, you, you can make just a fine living, have a fine family, live in a decent house. No, you're not going to get rich. But they know that going into the field of anthropology. Now I'd just like to run over a little bit about uh, uh, the UWF archaeology story. And that it gets a little uh, personal here because I started it. Um, uh, I did. I uh, was um, educated at Florida State University and Washington State University. I went to Washington State for my PhD uh, because I thought it was utopia. I thought there uh, men and women were equal. I thought it was a land of milk and honey. It was the late 60s, early 70s, and uh, San Francisco uh, and all of the hippie movement and was, was in full flower. And um, I found out that it's just like here in the South. The men were in control. It was basically a conservative government. And, uh, and I better get used to it. And I did. I had a great time. Uh, but it's a huge university, and uh, as is Florida State. And then I went uh, to the University of Alabama, another big university with a long history of archaeology. They were one of the first uh, institutions to do archaeology in the South. Uh, and uh, so it, it has a great story. And I couldn't stand it. Um, what I couldn't stand about the large universities, and to this day I still can't stand it, is the culture. The culture inside an academic department, inside a research one institution, is vicious. It's very difficult. It is, uh, it is um, uh, fraught with competition between professors, uh, and it is all about them. Uh, you have a niche, you must fill it, and if you don't, you will uh, fail. You're, you basically do what you're told, and it's very restrictive. Although it is a great university, often they have great football teams, uh, and they have a big alumni, and they're famous. But inside, in the department, I found it for me, it was a very uncomfortable place. I am a team player. I do believe in helping other people. I don't think it's all about me. I don't think it's all about how much money I can get or how I can steal your students to be my students and how I can keep my students from being your students and, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, so I, I didn't want to go into the private sector. I didn't want to go into the government sector. And so what I did was come here. I wanted to go to a place that had a clean slate. I wanted to come back to the South because I stay in the South and come here because I know the culture. I know when people say no and they mean yes. <laughs> I know when people say yes and they really mean no. 
I can read their body language. I can read what they don't say. I can see what they're thinking by the expressions on their face. I was raised in this culture over in Panama City. So if there's any place that I know the people and what's really going on on the surface and underneath, it's here. I know the social relationships. I know the religions that are here and how they get along and all of the mix of the people that we have in Northwest Florida. I know our particular uh, left out feeling of the rest of the state. I know we're poorer than that. And that kind of gives us a little bit of an extra charge. So I also knew another very important thing is that the archaeology around Pensacola was really good. There had never been a professional archaeologist here in Pensacola. When I was at Florida State, the professor, uh, the Pensacola was part of uh, Florida State's area. And we used to come over from time to time and do a little archaeology. Uh, I remember when the Girl Scout camp was over at what is now Gulf Islands National Seashore and Naval Live Oaks, and we used to stay there. It's a big Indian site there, and we stayed in the cabins and got chiggers and, and um, uh, dug up some wonderful archaeological strange finds. And we'd come over and we'd find something else again. And the chairman of my department did historical archaeology, which is post-Columbus, and that was considered very not correct. The older, the better when I was in college. Uh, but I knew that it had wonderful archaeology, and Pensacola was not developed. In other words, it wasn't Miami, it wasn't Orlando, it wasn't Tallahassee that had been dug on by archaeologists for at least one or two generations. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, I wanted a, a place, uh, if I couldn't find a university that I liked I was, or a program, I was going to have to build my own. And so I did want a place that didn't know anything about archaeology, no history, no bad stories. They didn't know how bad archaeologists could be. Uh, they didn't know all of the problems archaeologists had, and I didn't want them to know. I wanted to see, and this was a great experiment with my life, I wanted to see if I could develop a program that was kind, that was sharing, that was a team, that put the students first, that shared archaeology with the public, and uh, uh, that was, was able to, uh, to to, to be a good, personal place to be. And I didn't know whether it would work or not. I had no idea. But I got this big contract with the Corps of Engineers and uh, when I was at the University of Alabama, and it was successful. They built a waterway called the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway. It goes from Mobile up to the Tennessee River, up through the state of Alabama, states of Alabama and Mississippi, and it was a huge project. And they needed someone with my, my background, which is a big major excavation experience. So, so I thought, well, um, I, the only way that I would continue to work on this project is if I could leave the University of Alabama and come to the University of West Florida. And uh, the Corps of Engineers sponsored it, and um, they were having to do compliance archaeology. And uh, I said, uh, I, that's the only way that I would, I would do the next, uh, the next um, phase of the excavation. And, and they said, uh, that's OK. I said, no, they haven't said yes yet. And uh, the project was a couple million dollars. It was the largest project in the eastern United States with a single principal investigator. And so I came to the University of West Florida in my truck, and I found the chairman of the sociology department, Dallas Blanchard. And Dallas um, is passed away, but Dallas was a kind and gentle soul, and who knew enough about archaeology uh, to understand what it was. And I needed a sponsor. You still do when you walk into the univer any university with this idea you want to start an archaeology program and bring a couple million dollars with a soft money contract. Like, who are you? And uh, so Dallas sponsored me, and so I said, all right, uh, in order to do this, this is what I need. I want to start a Department of Anthropology with two faculty lines. I want to start a, 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 a research uh, entity, and I, uh, I'm going to be gone for three years. <laughs> and, uh, but I bring in all my money. I'm bringing $2 million, and you get 20% 20, 20 of it. And uh, they said, um, OK. And I said, really? And they said, yes. And I said, all right, this is the building that I want. I wanted to be right next to building 10, which is the president's office, because I had the building. Because I know building 13, out of sight is out of mind, and inside is in mind. So I always wanted to be close to the power center on campus, because archaeologists had always been in the basement in the worst building in the back of the bus. And that's not the road to success. The road to success is where the power and the money is. And then you need to know who you are and what you're doing. 
And so they said, all right. So the math department was there, Jeremy. And, and we kicked the math department out. And they said, sure, sure. So they gave me everything I want. I said, got to have a curation building, got to have this. And I took Dallas aside and I said, Dallas, why are they saying yes? He said, because they don't think you'll get it. I said, but it's a sole source contract. He said, they don't believe you. He said, staple all these things they said yes to to the proposal that you send to the Corps of Engineers, and then they become part of the contract. I said, they don't believe me? I said, no, they don't believe me. I said, okay, okay. So I did, and of course I got it. And they complied with almost everything they said they would. And so uh, we, uh, uh, we, we began. And so uh, I was trained in very ancient archaeology, prehistoric or pre-Columbian archaeology. My specialty was either um, uh, 2,000 years ago or a culture about six to 8,000 years ago. And so we, that's why I came to UWF. I came here for the archaeology that was here, but in order to get the money, I had to do work in Mississippi. And that was fine. I, I, told, I told the Corps of Engineers, I don't have a shovel. I don't have a truck. The university doesn't have a thing. You're going to have to completely equip us. And they said, OK. I said, all right. You're going to have this huge equipment bill, and I'm not buying the cheapest stuff. I'm going to buy stuff that'll last for 20 years. And now it's been over 30, and we're still using some of the wheelbarrows and some of those tables and some of those chairs. And uh, that's because I was trained to take care of my equipment, and, uh, and we still do. So at any rate, that is why I came to UWF. I came for, for here for the archaeology, and I came here for the, um, uh, the ability to start a program that I thought had the right values. Um, uh, it was, I, I talk about myself as a walk-on. Nobody asked me to come here. I asked to come here. Soft money means once it's spent, it's spent. It's not recurring money. And I also came here with a different kind of an attitude. I am not a typical archaeologist, although I do fit very well with them. I'm very comfortable. But most archaeologists are a little bit quieter than I am. Uh, they are not as concerned with, uh, with um, growth and development as I am, but at any rate, my attitude uh, is one of growth and development. Um, uh, I also uh, am, uh, what is different about our story is that I quickly began to be the friend of the administration and politicians, uh, because that is where the power and the money is, and it still is. I began to think about archaeology from the president's point of view, from the dean's point of view. I began to think about them uh, as uh, what their problems were and how I, with archaeology, could solve their problems. And, for example, what, the pro what any president really needs is good PR. Good PR. It's, it's priceless. You can't buy it. It has to be good, has to be steady, they have to trust you. What is a dean like? A dean likes somebody that is reliable, that gets drawn into the research that we're doing, gets shared with, it, with the information, and is part of the program. And so, uh, what do politicians do? Politicians have the money. And archaeology is very expensive. It costs millions of dollars. And so I, sh you know, I realized that archaeology, to be successful, had to be a friend of administration and politicians. And actually, they were all pretty interested in what we were finding. They were interested in what we were doing and how we were doing it. How did you know that site was there, Judy? How did you know to dig here and not over there? And these were real questions. Uh, tell me about Neanderthals. Are they really our ancestors? Uh, what about the theory? And, and, they would add, and I realized that there is a wealth of, uh, of curiosity about the past and archaeology out there in administrators and politicians. And it's not negative. They weren't just being nice to me. Now, archaeology at UWF has filled several niches. Uh, niches, I realized, one of the things I realized first and foremost is if I tried to do traditional archaeology, the kind of archaeology that is done at Research One institutions, I would fail. There is no love for prehistoric Indian archaeology um, uh, here. And, and it's covered very well, and that's what most archaeologists in the southeast were at the time. That's what they studied. So I thought, well, what does Pensacola have? They have history. And I see Dr. Clune, the chairman of the history department, is here. And I basically wrote history's coattails. Everybody pretty well knew, the public did, and the students did, that we have history. Nobody argued about it. Nobody worried about it. They didn't know many details, but we have history. Well, 
Of course, I know that there's archaeology with it, but nobody else did. Everybody thought it was all gone. So I um, uh, started with, uh, I mean, I, I quickly moved into historical archaeology, and it was an emerging field. Another thing is about the public part. One of the things that archaeologists that trained me uh, were doing is they did archaeology for each other. They didn't share archaeology with non-archaeologists. We had a special language. We had a special club. We had special societies. We have special publications. And we speak in five-syllable words. And that's the way we liked it. That's the way archaeology was. And most of it still is. But I found that with, with no backing from the university, I mean, I spent all the money I had, and then I had to go get more from projects and grants, um, uh, that uh, uh, the public was very interested, and they would volunteer. And so there are many people here that were some of the original volunteers in archaeology who have come to help us. And I gave them a shovel. I gave them a screen. I gave them uh, 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 forms. I gave them the cameras. And I found, really, a well of a reservoir of talent, skilled patients in, uh, in the public. And all they really wanted to do was to be a part of it and to be part of the discovery and the analysis and the scientific reporting of archaeology. And when you do find something for the first time, when you dig up a piece of a cup that was that was left behind from 1722 out on an island. And you're the first person to see that in all those years. And you know what it is. It's a thrill. It's a special thing. When we saw Tristan de Luna's shipwreck for the first time, and I knew that Tristan de Luna sailed into Pensacola in those ships, and we found him. Roger Smith found it. I told him not even look because he wouldn't find it. And he found it on his first try. <laughs> you know, my hat's off to Roger every day. And, and, and there it was. And then we had this anchor that's huge. And we found body armor from, from the 1500s. And I learned to scuba. And I went down and I saw those things. I thought, you know, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like the thrill of discovery. And, and, and the public gets it. It's a human thing. And so, uh, uh, I found that the public, without the public, I would have been a total failure. The public carried us and continues to carry us. The Pensacola Archaeological Society is full of people that do that. Public archaeology was just beginning, and it was mainly beginning in cities. Um, Bo uh, not Boston, um, Alexandria, Virginia, had one of the first public archaeologists. And I would go pick her brain and ask her, how did she get the volunteers to do this? How did she get this torpedo factory nobody wanted turned into an archaeological lab? And she would tell me, and I would I'd run back, and I'd do that. Now, I wasn't trained in historical archaeology. So I, I had, you know, the books and cheat sheets and all of that, and what is this piece of pottery? And I had to say I didn't know, and I had to go look it up. And that's all right, you know. Uh, people loved it. I was learning it. And in a way, it was kind of fun for all of us to learn it together. I knew the techniques, but I didn't know the details. It's kind of like being a physician in a town that has an epidemic. But it's not your specialty. But you're still the only doctor in town. At least you know medicine. You know, you know the basics of it. And the details you can learn along the way. And we did. And uh, also doing archaeology that is local. Most, 99% of the archaeologists in the world dig somewhere else from where their base is. I wanted to dig here because it was cheaper. It was great. I could do it all year round. And I, I, I didn't have to just do it in little six-week or 12-week segments. We could do it all the time. And I would, you know, I, I would run down. I would go to my class and I would teach. I'd run downtown and do a little work. I'd run back and teach. But, you know, I was 40. I mean, I was full of energy. And so it was, uh, 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 and I did it all to begin with. But that's just the beginning. And I knew it was just the beginning. And uh, pretty soon, uh, those five things, or, or four things, are, um, are really the niches that we created and filled that are unusual. Very few people were doing local archaeology. Very few were including the public. Very few were doing historical or post-Columbus archaeology. And almost no one was doing shipwrecks. Shipwreck archaeology was considered treasure hunters, cowboy archaeologists, and the best thing you can do is just stay away from them, or you'll ruin your career. And that was true in a lot of cases. But uh, when, uh, uh, when we uh, uh, began to uh, uh, find, when Roger Smith, the state underwater archaeologist, found the Luna shipwreck, I went to President Marks and I said, OK, President, 
Uh, we're going to have to get into shipwreck archaeology because we've been asked to be the academic partner for Tristan de Luna's shipwreck. And President Marks looked at me and said, well, why is that? I said, because if you don't, Texas A&M is going to fly their research vessel in here and their flag is going to be in your and my backyard and I'll be dang if I'm going to put up with that. He said, sold. <laughs> so, and so, and then he went in it with trepidation. Students can die. It's easy to hurt yourself. It's a very dangerous and the most expensive archaeology you could possibly do. Absolutely the most expensive. All right. So about four years later, we were on, Morris and I were on some, he was still president, we were, we were on some, some uh, groundbreaking project, and he took me aside and he said, Judy, we're not going to run out of shipwrecks, are we? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 President Mark, don't you worry, we're not going to run out, we've got enough for our lifetimes and ten lifetimes. And so, so those were the niches, and we played them, and, and all of those were a gamble, but those were niches that were not filled. And we had all of those ingredients here in Pensacola. We knew we had history. We knew it was local. We included the public, who was always eager and always has been my, my strongest base of archaeology here. And um, uh, uh, shipwreck archaeology is just absolutely the icing on the cake. And we're there in spades. So uh, it, it, it's good. But uh, I wanted to show you, I'm not going to go over one, over one of these. What I want to tell you is that because I was doing non-traditional archaeology, uh, we had, um, uh, I went through the, uh, all the rungs on the ladder and wound up from being, I was actually an adjunct at the old Panama City Center in 77. And in 2006, we had the Division of Archaeology and Anthropology, and that includes an anthropology department with a master's and a bachelor's. It includes the Archaeology Institute with a multi-million dollar budget. It includes the Florida Public Archaeology Network with a multi-million dollar budget, which is spread all over the state of Florida. Uh, and I, I, was, I was just doing fine. And uh, the, my, the real Maya had written five books. Uh, I had uh, lots of articles. I was had president of one of the largest archaeological societies in the country. And uh, we were doing really leading edge research. Those things there were very important to, uh, 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 we were leaders in the, that kind of archaeology. The Mexico uh, archaeology, I went there to uh, start doing colonial archaeology in Veracruz because that's where the Spaniards who uh, actually were Mexicans who came to Pensacola in the 1600s um, uh, came from. They, they didn't come from Spain. And uh, there was, uh, uh, I was going down, I had a, a research grant, and uh, 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 we, were, we were doing fine work in Veracruz. And I'll just tell you one thing about Veracruz. Uh, first of all, they don't like colonial history. It's not their brightest period, okay? It's not something they're proud of. They were conquered, they were treated like dogs, and they uh, lost all of their, their status. They look back to the Aztecs, they look back to the Teotihuacanos, they look back to the pyramid builders, and that's the history and the period and the archaeology that, that they, they uh, tout. Uh, colonial period, who cares? That meant empty niche, right? I wasn't going to step on anybody's toes. Nobody cared. They could give a flip about it. And so when I, I picked Veracruz because there was an archaeologist there who had partnered with me, as long as I brought my own money, and I did. I know better. When you're a walk-on, you need to bring your money. And uh, we began to excavate in Veracruz. And it went deeper and deeper and deeper. It was as deep as this room is tall, full of artifacts from only the 1500s. Um, um, Cort, um, not Cortez. Who's the um, conqueror of the Aztecs? Who conquered the Aztecs? Cortez. Cortez. Yes, I was right. Cortez is the bottom. It slips away, folks. Uh, Cortez at the bottom, and uh, it had about 1,800, maybe 1,900 at the top. But they had, you know, these fronts that are coming across our country now, the North America. At the bottom of those fronts is a little cyclone. They call them hurricanes. And Veracruz was founded on the beach, just like on Pensacola Beach. They had no harbor. They put rocks out, and they made a, a jetty. And that means the sands, the, the sand storms have deposits, make deposits all the time on, in the city. And uh, uh, people walk around in blankets. Uh, there are sandstorms all the time all winter. 
and it has caused a huge deposit of sand that has separated out all of the uh, uh, artifacts very far. There is almost no mixing. In Pensacola, when we go downtown here from the 1700s to the Civil War, it's about this deep. In Veracruz, it's six feet thick. Right? Okay. So that means that the archaeological sites have huge integrity. I went under parking lots. I went in backyards. I paid people. I didn't park in the parking lots. I dug in the parking lots and paid my monthly rate as if I were parking. And uh, you, you have to be creative. And so anyway, so I was, I was several months into the project, and I'm getting on the plane coming back uh, from my monthly visit, and I, I hear Dr. Kavanaugh left. And he was leaving, and he was going to Pennsylvania, and he had this great job. And I thought, oh, man, i got to break in another one. I really don't have time, and they don't understand archaeology. And I had Kavanaugh understanding it. He liked it. He helped me. And um, uh, so I got off the plane, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm coming home, and I'm home, and I get up the next morning, and my phone starts ringing. And uh, uh, an explosion happened in my life. Uh, it was the interim presidency. And I was absolutely shocked, first of all, that someone would think I could be president. And of course I said, no, uh, I'm busy. I'm really busy. And then the next one was, um, I don't know how to be a president. And maybe I, maybe I would be a bad president. And Dean Hallinan, uh, uh kept on my case, and then the deans all ganged up on me. And um, I said, well, it's nine months. It's just they're going to start a search. All right, I'll do it for a year. And, uh, and I did it for a year. And they did not do a search. They asked me to stay on another year. And I said, OK. Um, but the longer you stay out of your field, the, most, the, 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 the worse it is. And they said, all right, uh, I'll do two years. And then uh, the, the trustees asked me how long I would be president. And I said, well. I'm going to be 70 in 2015, so let's pick that as a date. And uh, they said, OK. And I said, fine. And, um, but now I'll tell you the story of the presidency and tie it into archaeology. First of all, why me? There are a lot of people at the university that could have done what I did, could have been an interim president and a president. But there were some. Uh, special circumstances, why the interim? They wanted someone from campus. They didn't want someone from the outside or from the community. They wanted someone from the inside that they knew and trusted. And uh, uh, they needed, a, they expected a quick search. And one thing Jane uh, has pointed out to me several times uh, is that I don't have any enemies. I'm sure I do now. <laughs> uh, but at the time, I, I didn't. And, and uh, it is part of my philosophy is that enemies can only hurt you. That's all they can do is hurt you. And so I have tried very hard not to take from people. And when I had money, I shared it with other people. I would get money in lumps after a while, huge lumps of recurring funds that I couldn't spend all in one year. And I would have money left over. I would get it every year, but I couldn't spend it all in one year. And I would begin to give it to people at the university. And they thought I wanted something. I wanted nothing. Maybe a chip in the future if I got into hard times, you know. But still, to give it to them. I didn't do it a tremendous amount. But what I did do is go get my own money. I didn't use theirs. I didn't take theirs. And I shared. So that made for friends, not enemies. And I did skip several rungs on the ladder. I've never done this terrible job of being, difficult job of being a dean. I never have been a vice president. And only 3% of all the presidents in the country have made this leap. And there are over 4,500 4, colleges and universities in the country. And uh, there, I only know of three archaeologists, one of which was an interim. So there's one other archaeologist who's a president. And he's in uh, Montana, at Montana State. Uh, so um, uh, that, that, that was kind of the leap and, and the story. Now, why do it? Why would I stop doing archaeology, the one thing that I had, I was really getting really good at? First of all, when you build a program, 
you, it starts with you, and it focuses on you for a long time. It's like building up a practice. And, and uh, that the good news is that apparently you can do it. The bad news is that when you leave, it can collapse around you or behind you. And you have to have an exit plan. I remember I turned 55 in, in 2000, and uh, we were sitting at some meeting, and Jane was there, and I said, well, I'm, I need to have an exit plan. And they all looked at me like I was crazy, and I wasn't anywhere near retirement. And I said, no, no, exit plans take a lot of time and money. You know, this is a house of cards. If I was killed in a car wreck, it would die today, uh, um, tomorrow, the, the program would. Because, uh, uh, anyway, so I began to, what should it look like when I retire? How much is it going to cost? And then to go get the money and then to implement the plan. So I thought 10 years was about how long it would take to do that. And so um, I had made a plan. I had gotten the money. I had uh, uh, implemented almost all of it. I had two key people. I had Elizabeth Benchley, who uh, can run almost anything put in front of her. And second, I had, uh, we had just hired John Worth, a Spanish colonial historical archaeologist who was just <coughs> wonderful. He's better than I ever was. And uh, uh, so I was very comfortable uh, with that. And uh, so the exit plan was almost done. And also, when you've been someplace 28 years, you know what should have been done. You know all the things that should have been done that weren't done for one reason or another. We had no visibility. People in Panama City, half of them didn't know where we were. Uh, growth, we had never grown, except a little bit, an inch to long. It had not been a priority with anybody. Uh, and uh, we had a commuter college, and we didn't have any student in collegiate life. And we were a school of the 80s. We weren't a school that was modern and growing and uh, uh, that was with it. And I, you know, my earring is banging against this, isn't it? Hang on a minute. There. Um, and I, uh, it takes, these are difficult things for a president to do. And the reason they're difficult is because they require change. All of those four things require changing the culture at the University of West Florida. They involve changing the image of the university to the public. They require a different pace. They require a different vision. They require a different attitude. And if they fail, you're toast. Well, my career is in archaeology. And I'm not adverse to taking risks, especially when I know the outcome can be very, very good. So I decided to lay down my shovel and pick up this risk to try to do something for the university, to bring it closer to the community. Where are you? You're not doing anything for the community. You're up there, up on the hill, and nobody ever comes down here. And half of that was true. You know, you ever seen a billboard with UWF on it? No, and they didn't want one. You know, they wanted to be the Harvard of the South. They wanted to be the Vanderbilt of the South. They wanted to be the Wilmington of the South. I wanted to be the University of West Florida. I wanted it to serve the region. I wanted to pay attention to the region. I wanted it to be proud of itself. And all of those things were not what the university had been doing, certainly not putting any money into it. So I picked those things to do. And I figured for as long as I was the interim, that those were the kinds of things that were relatively um, simple to do. They didn't require being an experienced president. I had done all of those things in archaeology, and I was applying them to the university. And I was hoping that um, I could have enough momentum and success in those things that when my time was up, when they finally hired a, a real president, that they would be going so well the newie would pick it up. That's what I'd hoped. That was the plan. So when they asked me to do year two, I said yes, because I didn't have enough momentum. When they asked me for a real contract for five years, I thought, you know, I might be able to get some of these to home plate. So that is why. I did give up the one thing, and I do miss it, that I really, really do well. And I find it's hard for me to be around archaeologists, because when I'm there, I know I'm home. And that's why I kind of avoid it, because it makes me sad. It makes me question my sanity. It makes me worry. And, uh, and I hope that I keep my health long enough that I will be able to go back and finish the sixth book 
and not lose everything that I learned. But that's why I stopped my life and did this. Now, what were the hardest parts? Now, I was 63, and I was showing up at 9 o'clock. I was going home at 5. I'd stop working on the weekends. I'd start and started to have a few hobbies. I was going back to my family farm and fixing it up. And I was living a real nice senior life in the university. And the pace is a killer. It is 5.30, you're up. 7.30, you're on. You're the program. And uh, the, it never stops. I have never seen a schedule this bad, but every president is that way. It's not just me or my schedulers, and you're also not in charge of it. Uh, uh, my schedule changed three times today, uh, and I had to get used to that. The pace and the schedule are just really killers. Uh, and uh, I didn't know if I had that much energy, but I do. I do. I have enough. Uh, I am real tired sometimes on the, uh, on the weekends. Uh, and there's a weekend schedule, too. But uh, at any rate, uh, those are two of the hardest parts. Another hard part. In archaeology, when, and when you're in any profession or any discipline or any business, so what you do all day. You may work on one project or one aspect of archaeology or medicine or dentistry or math or physics, but you're doing what you know something about all day. And in the presidency, the topics change not only the topics change, but the bad or good topics change. You know, you'll have a terrible meeting about a lawsuit. Somebody's going to come after you with no holes barred. Then you'll be going to a ribbon cutting for a wonderful new building. Then you come back to, to a professor who wants to, who wants to you know, close the doors. Then you'll be talking to the union who wants a raise. And then you go to lunch with the president of a bank. And that's just the morning. And I thought, holy cow, this is, this is something. So, um, and I, I'm kind of used to, I had a day like that today, I did, uh, but you know, I've learned to compartmentalize and uh, more. And uh, another thing that was hard is I was a novice again. I, I was going to meetings outside the university and not knowing anyone in the room. I was going to meetings with presidents and I was really lonesome. I knew everybody in archaeology by that time. They knew me. I had some status. I was a senior archaeologist, successful program, all those, those niche things. Those were real success points in my career. And, um, and, and no one knew my name nor cared. Interim President Judy Benz from Nowhere University. And um, so I thought, oh my god, this is terrible. And then I started looking at the president. And I looked at their hair. I looked at their clothes. I looked at their manners. I looked at them. And I wasn't like that. I said, oh, man. <laughs> I don't fit in. I had never not fitted in in a long, long time. And I began to worry that I would hurt the university because I wasn't polished enough to represent the university in the higher education world. I didn't know their language. I didn't know their names. And, and I didn't know the subject. I'd never read a book on higher education. And then when they asked me, when they kind enough to ask who I was and how I became president, and I told them they got mad. Because they'd all worked their way up the ladder and I'd skipped all the rungs. So I had to stop saying my story and just say, no, I'm, I'm just the interim president and that, that's enough because they had spent 20 years climbing that ladder and doing things they didn't want to do and giving up their discipline that they really liked and didn't want to leave, but they did because they wanted to go, you know, the story. So um, I just shut up about that part. Um, that's the presidential society business. Um, I've never been better groomed. Uh, my hair usually is combed now, and uh, my clothes fit, and uh, I lost a lot of weight because uh, uh, presidents look fit, and they are fit. And um, you have, I'm serious, I'm an anthropologist. I'm seeing what they're doing. I'm seeing all the things that they do. It's not bad. It's just another subset of our culture. And um, so I really, I really began to worry um, that I was, I was not a good fit. And then one day when I was going down to uh, be, um, what they call it, ratified by the Board of Governors to be the interim president, I met up, uh, I was sitting there in what was then my best clothes, and 
and I was I was sitting on the aisle and I was nervous and the chairman of the board was going to submit my name to be the interim president because you have to be ratified and um, and this woman president Judy Genshaft she's the president of University of South Florida walks down the aisle just you know walking down you know going from the table where the presidents sit to somewhere in, outside the room she was in a five thousand dollar dress <laughs> she was in a thousand dollar pair of shoes she had jewelry that was perfect her hair has never been messy <laughs> and I thought my goodness and she was the only other woman president and all the others were beautiful men <laughs> beautiful men not a dog in there <laughs> they all came from these you know clean sciences and I really did I, I got worried and thought uh, this nine months I, I'm out of here and, and I, I came back and, and I, I thought about this and I would go to the, the first of the presidential meetings and, and I, I, would feel, I would feel not a good fit. And after about, I guess about six months of that, I realized, I had a little talk with myself, and I realized that the reason that I was asked to be the interim president of the University of West Florida was for myself. And that you liked me. And they liked me. And I need to concentrate on being myself. That I don't want to be like them. I want to be like me. And like the fit that I have at the university and the fit that I have in the community is something that I treasure. And so get over it. And I got over it. And I've been having a good time ever since with all the other presidents who kind of wish they, uh, I think, uh, uh, had a little bit more freedom because they're in a pretty narrow niche. And you all know me. What you really are is a president's base, base of support. And no one in the state, other than maybe John Hitt at University of Central Florida, has a larger base of support. I know that I can take a chance, that I can try to do something like football, or try to do something like University Park, or try to change a culture at the university. And I may not hit a home run, but you all know I'm up there swinging the bat. And nobody's going to try harder, and I just keep up going up to bat. And so I quit worrying about it, but it really worried me the first uh, year or two. Now, there are a lot of parallels. I was a walk-on again. All of a sudden, I was not prepared. I didn't know any of the, 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 uh, the background. I, I, I didn't have, uh, I had soft money being interim. There were no guarantees. Uh, and so I was, I was used to that of walking on. Uh, the second thing is I, I had to change fields on the job. I went from prehistoric to historic archaeology. Well. I went from being a, a, a chairman and a, a director to a president and uh, on the job. And thank gosh, I have a, a great presidential staff. Uh, uh, Kim Brown, the chief of staff, uh, really taught me how to be president. And other presidents taught me. And I've always been one to pick up the phone and call in archaeology or anything else. How, how does this work, man? I just don't get this. Or how did you do that? How did you get that football stadium? How did you get that arena? How did you, how, how'd you uh, uh, get the money for this PhD program? And they would tell me. And I appreciate that. And I take it and apply it to UWF. So it, it's not all that hard. And it's also all about politics and money. And as you know, uh, I'm always comfortable around politicians. And I'm, I'm used to big budgets. Granted, we added a few zeros when I became president. But it was still huge amounts of money. But I have accountants, and I have budget officers, and I've got vice presidents. All of those things to give you support. So um, I'm really not a walk-on because it was a big staff. And I didn't have that to begin with. And I still um, uh, am taking on some of the biggest challenges. Um, I, I didn't have any money to do what I wanted to do at UWF. Uh, it was the worst recession in our lifetime. Uh, I've had, we experienced nothing but budget cuts. Uh, I was an unknown. And uh, I have big ideas. And I also have vision. And vision is a blessing and a curse. Vision means you can see it, which is good. But it's a curse because it takes a so long. It's a curse because you can't get to it. It's like a dream. A vision is a good word for it. So these are all parallels that I had in archaeology. I always knew I wanted a nationally ranked 
archaeology program that was kind and gentle and student-oriented, that was rigorous, that had a good academic re uh, reputation, that gave back to the community and did something different in their program. I knew that day, on, day one when I walked on, my friends said I was crazy. And they saw me struggle. And it was years before I, I had a steady paycheck. But I knew that it would come if I worked hard enough. So, so it, that's sort of the same kind of challenge. Um, the same elements for success that I used in archaeology, I'm using here. I'm using, I'm using the talents that I have. And then I'm surrounding myself with people who complement my many weaknesses. And, and who will help me do what, what, uh, what we need to do. It is a team sport. The team is just bigger. That's all. It's just bigger. But it's still teamwork. It's still sharing. It's still helping each other. And if, you're, if, if you don't help, you've got to get out of the way. Because we have a very narrow window. And I'm the only archaeologist, or the only president, that, that, that could probably pull off some of this stuff for the University of West Florida. And I know it. I know the next president that comes to this university will probably be a very traditional president, one that has come up the ranks, one that is polished and looks and wears, you know, that, that, that is a professional president. And we probably will need that. I don't know what they'll pick, but I know that they'll never have another me. And when I look at it critically, I can do those visionary things. I can make a difference. The biggest surprises. I never thought I would be president. It never crossed my mind. I thought they were kidding when they asked me. And, and I will never be that surprised, I hope, in my life again. <laughs> but as I began to think about it, and I, Jane, I, I think I had this conversation with you on the phone out on my patio, when I realized that being asked to be president of this university was the biggest compliment that I've ever had in my life. It says so much about everything. And I was overwhelmed with that, and I still am. It is a compliment. There's no higher compliment in a university or a community to be asked to be president of the university, that's, uh, the, the local university. And so I, um, I was very humbled by it. I was surprised. I did not know that the depth of support for what we had been doing in archaeology and that what, uh, uh, what was so deep. I, the day I was named interim president, I went over to Pensacola, what is now Pensacola State College, and had lunch with President Meadows and gave him an olive branch. The next day, I went and had lunch with then President Richburg at Northwest Florida State College and passed the olive branch. I said, we're not going to fight anymore. Um, and that first week, Everywhere I went in this town, people would stop, get out of their car, and hug me, and the women would cry for happiness. The grocery store, the junior store, the gas station, I had never experienced that in my life. Tears, women who were, rare, who were much older, 70, 80, 90 years old, would say, I never thought a woman would be president. This is just a wonderful thing. And I said, I didn't either, you know? I never thought we'd have a woman president. I thought if we'd be the last one. And uh, we're not. Uh, and, and, but it was, it was sheer joy of the community. It was kind of like we had one of their own. I had a barbecue, and it poured. And there were hundreds of people there on campus and, and from the community. I had no idea I had that much support. Um, and uh, uh, one of the biggest surprises is that we have, at the university, changed our attitude and come in with these new changes with the support of our trustees and the students and faculty and the community despite this recession. We don't pay attention to the recession. There's nothing we can do about it. What we can do is what we concentrate on. And that's a difference in attitude. Every once in a while I whine. I mean, we lost $12 million this year. But we paid for it out of our savings. And I'm going to try to not. We're all trying not to get that, that cut again. So all of these are parallels with archaeology. There was no money. There was a, the attitude of archaeology was different. The community supported archaeology. And it was a wonderful opportunity. And one of the biggest surprises is that I really could do it. I really didn't know, but I was going to give it a shot. Now, I've gotten up and struck out, man. I've been told no, and I wouldn't give it to you if I had the money. You know, no, this is a terrible idea, and you have to go away now. Uh, right. I didn't, but that's what I was told. 
Uh, but but uh, that, I, that I really could do, and that was very surprised, and that it is really working. And so this is what you see now at the University of West Florida. You see a dormitory on the right that is collegiate. You see students that are wearing our gear and having fun. You see a new college of business building. You see a new attitude. You see school spirit. I always thought our students really deserve to have the collegiate experience. I would go to other universities and in our state, and I would get mad that our students don't have that student union. Our students don't have that football team. Our students don't have those dorms. They don't have those buildings. What the heck is the matter with us? Why were our people so asleep at the wheel and we missed the boom? You know, why didn't we take advantage of it? And I would go around stomping about that. Well, well, we're on our way. And I wanted to play a little video for you that kind of reflects our attitude. It's on our website. And uh, this is our attitude. That's our attitude. That's change. That's a good cultural change. We can do anything we want to, despite the economic times, despite the recession, despite anything. And we are changing. And we're proud of it. And everybody knows it. And they, uh, uh, it has been an opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, and what an ending to a career I could never have scripted. Uh, I know that the young students in the room I never thought I would be president. But I will tell you what I learned in my discipline and what I learned by disciplining myself to be successful in it in a competitive world uh, has really geared me to do almost anything. And so it is, it is, uh, it is quite, quite, quite fascinating. And I want to thank all of you for your support. I know that everybody in this room supports me and the university, what we do. I know we have faculty and students and graduate students and staff. And it is very humbling to be the president. It is uh, a privilege, and uh, many presidents refer to our life as the privileged life. It is a privileged life, and uh, I'll never take it for granted. And I will tell you that we're going to crack 13,000 students next year. We're going to have a football team in a few years by hook or by crook. And we're going to have an absolutely gorgeous campus. Our master plan is just a knockout with University Park, with, with, a, with an arena, with a new student union, with, with a, a tennis stadium, with a soccer stadium, all of those things. This thing I'm wearing around my neck is a national championship baseball, uh, uh, what they give women. They give men a ring. Uh, our, uh, well, I wouldn't wear it. Uh, and, uh, and our women's soccer team is number one in the country as of yesterday. These are the kinds of things that give students hope. So, so anyway, so that's kind of it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them uh, and answer them. If you don't, I, I've probably gone a little long. I didn't even look at my watch, but uh, I was afraid I'd be short. Yeah, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, President Benz. Certainly, uh, I think all of us are leaving with even greater enthusiasm for your leadership than when we arrived. 
You mentioned your personality traits, which we all recognize and respect, one being certainly your positive attitude and assertiveness and confidence. You spoke of growth and development. You spoke about your understanding that as a walk-on, you needed to foster friendships with politicians and administration. Yes. And then you reminded us that U.S. archaeology was very vulnerable to unpredictable things and events. One of those, I would contend, would be the BP restoration funding mm. that is in front of us. And it's interesting, in light of your passion for archaeology and the admission that archaeology is certainly vulnerable to something unpredictable like this, I'm curious about, at this particular time, how you as an archaeologist can help us bridge the gap and face the economic reality, and that being the prosperity that may be associated with this BP restoration, if in fact the university's vision of cultural tourism for our area comes to fruition, how do you and Dr. Elizabeth Benchley and your peers help really fuse or marry the love and preservation of archaeology with the reality that this particular proposal is based on the tremendous prosperity brought on by jobs and in fact could mean that we do actually create vertical development on top of what you all consider sacred archaeology oh. archaeological sites all right thank you well that's the easy part of the question the, the last part Th thank you councilman uh, uh, i uh, um, uh, the one thing about archaeology, it is not like uh, the environmental rules and regulations. Uh, 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 if you find an endangered species, you have to preserve their habitat, and that can really stop a, a development project dead. Uh, the latest uh, example is our beach mouse. Uh, that, that is a real, a real blocker to development. What, what you do with archaeology is, uh, first of all, uh, when a development is planned, it will never, a development will never stop. Archaeology will never stop a development. What you just need to do is archaeology ahead of the development. That's all. And these are planned projects. They're not going to take a long time, right? And so uh, you involve the archaeologists, and the uh, West Florida Historic Preservation has uh, 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 archaeologists uh, uh, on its uh, board and Dr. Benchley, and, and there's also uh, teams of archaeologists and, and historians uh, and uh, uh, architects with uh, Carter that, that understand that sensitive lead time, sensitively planned uh, development can take place anywhere in Pensacola. I'm not going to say it's easy. I'm not going to say it's cheap. But it's absolutely doable. It will never stop a project. Uh, it can be expensive, but you, know, you, you build it in. Uh, you also don't have to dig. You can just pour concrete and put the building on top of the concrete. There are lots of ways to avoid the archaeology, too. We're used to that in the world of private sector and government compliance. Uh, you know, that road's going to go in. That dam's going to go in. That bridge is going to go in. So you know what you have to do. So we're kind of trained in that. Uh, the other part is, um, is uh, uh, about the, the BP opportunity and heritage tourism. Is that, well, I think the thing that appeals to me the most when I have my economic president hat on is that um, it is a sustainable idea, that it will create jobs in the future. It will sustain itself from year to year. It will generate opportunities for businesses like bed and breakfasts and restaurants and, and uh, 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 shops to be developed. Uh, it will bring people downtown year after year after year. And I think that sustainable part of it is very important, and I hope it doesn't get lost in the ideas that are, that are for building buildings or for uh, uh, just you know, building one-time stuff. So I think that's a real important part of it. It can generate thousands of jobs and bring in millions of dollars year after year. Because the one thing that we've done in Pensacola for the last 30 years is explore its history and its archaeology. Folks, it's credible. It's authentic. The experts uh, 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 verify it. Uh, I'm telling you, it's on a national level significance. But we're the only people that know it. But when you get us already done what takes decades and decades of work, most of it is already done. And what you need to know, do now is to build on top of it the amenities that the public likes and expects when they travel.
10,000 of us baby boomers are retiring every day for the next 10 years. Every day. They can travel. Their nests are empty. Their pocketbooks are full. They have the time. And they will go see something new and historic. So I think we've got a real opportunity. I don't know if we'll get it or not. And, and, and we're, we're pulling together uh, uh, West Florida Historic Preservation, Inc. and University and all the, all the resources. I think the right relationship is to have it be a community project with the university and its experts providing the details and the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the basics of what needs to be done in order to have heritage tourism. A, a sensitive plan, a good design of a building, a, uh, a, a, um, a, uh, um, an idea of where the forts were and how to exhibit them. All of those, we've got that expertise here. So I, I think it, it, it's, it's easy, but the archaeology won't stop it. For the record, I hold part of this award. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Are you going to keep doing your unearthing Florida spots till you retire? Yeah, I, I am. I am. I am. Uh, I, I don't do the research. I don't write the scripts. I edit the scripts a little, and I am the voice. And we can squeeze that in. A lot of time it's on Saturday mornings so that I squeeze it in, but what's new? You know, uh, yeah. The answer is yes. I like it. I like it. It's fun. That sets my morning schedule. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. In fact, I think I'm going to do some recording this weekend. President Bantz, uh, thank you very much for this evening. Uh, first, please do not lose your sense of humor. <laughs> I can't take myself too seriously. <laughs> uh, second is, in your uh, uh, golf course and your football plan, do you expect them to show a profit? And second question is, uh, could you give us a thumbnail on your five-year building plan? Five-year building plan. Sure, sure. Um, first of all, the football won't ever make money. Okay, forget it. That's why we haven't started it because I got to find recurring money for it. And uh, until I can find a source of about two and a half million dollars, we're not going to have uh, football at UWF. So, because it's going to cost money. Period. Uh, even in Division One, but certainly in Division Two that we're in. So I have no expectations of anything but student life, having fun, winning, of course, but but the dollars will never be there. Um, in terms of the golf course, Seeing Kills Golf Course and Country Club that UWF now owns, uh, it does make money. It uh, made $200,000 last year, a little bit less the year before, and we are ramping it up by having events there that bring in money. Uh, we make money on every hamburger sold, on every uh, a tournament hold there, on every event that's held there. I think we're going to be in the black, but it's not exactly that's, that, that, that is important. I wouldn't have bought that, uh, a pig in the poke that would cost us money. What I want to do and what we will do is to use the golf course and country club to make more money. Fundraisers, for example. And uh, we just had our alumni uh, golf tournament. We usually have about 20 teams. We had 35. Because it's UWF and people want to come and help UWF. People want to have, we're going to build a little lodge there of rooms so people can stay overnight and have their weddings and their reunions. They have three weddings a Saturday in nice weather. And we'll, we'll make money on all of that. So I think it will be a, a money maker directly, but indirectly it's going to be a real big money maker for us. Uh, and uh, besides, you know, most universities as they move on up have a golf course and a country club. And our faculty like it. And the dean has, uh, um, uh, uh, thank God it's Friday, uh, um, uh, uh, events there. And the bar is very good. And you don't have to drink, but uh, it's fun, you know, and it's ours, and it's, it's good. I like it. Oh, the five-year plan. Well, I want to tell you, I want to see a thousand more beds under construction. I want to see the new student union <laughs> under construction. I want to see University Park, which is where the tennis courts and the intramural field are now. I want to see that complex coming out of the ground. I don't think I'll be around to see it completed because it's a long project. It'll take more than five years to do. But I want to see it out of the ground. And I'm pointing Matt Altier and our partners in the private sector to find ways to phase it, to start it, to bring it in. I want to see that coming out of the ground. I want to see that big S road that cuts our campus in half. I want to see it gone. I want to see a nice loop, a new student union. 
overlooking a lawn in a mall with a small little stadium with a big uh, athletic uh, uh, complex and, uh, and uh, an arena. I think that's possible. And four academic buildings, uh, multi-use buildings uh, uh, that are seven stories tall, that are surrounding the mall, retail on the bottom, academic departments in the middle, and housing on the top. Four of those. That's a thousand beds. I want to see those, those things coming out of the ground. I think we can do that in five years. Right. Mm -hmm. I appreciated the title of the, uh, of the series, uh, honoring the humanities and, and so on. But today, it seems that we also need to protect them. Yes, sir, we do. There's a strong movement afoot to convert universities to vocational schools. Yes. And I'd be interested in your views. Well, we worry about that. You know, we also know, those of us in higher education, higher education that waves of interest and criticism come and they go. There's not a university in the country that's going to hurt their liberal arts programs because they're not popular with the politicians or with the, um, uh, with the public. It is our responsibility to keep them, to wrap our arms around them, and to keep them healthy during this particular um, uh, um, period of time. I'll give you an example. Philosophy wanted a line of a new faculty position. And I said, sure, I'm going to explain a, a line in philosophy to, to the, you know, the, uh, the president of the Senate. When they want us to have an engineering group, more engineers, and I tossed about it, and I tossed about it, and I, I said, wait a minute. This particular philosopher is teaching critical thinking. And we get criticized a lot out in the public because we graduate students who supposedly can't think critically, which means you don't accept things blindly. And um, so I said, all right, with Jane's help, I said, all right, this professor is going to teach critical thinking, right? Right. This year? Next year, they're not going to teach 18th century French philosophy because I would get criticized for that. But critical thinking, you bet. So in a way, what we're doing is we're taking some of the issues that are real issues, reading, writing, and thinking, and we're supporting them within our humanities and our social sciences. So in a way, it's what they want us to do because they, um, uh, they're criticizing us, and sometimes justly that we don't put enough emphasis on that. Our writing lab can be expanded. Our, our English uh, faculty can do more, uh, uh, more with, with teaching students how to write, how to, criti how to criticize what is written. So that's how we're doing it. We're really doing it by taking some of the criticisms that we are getting about the social uh, sciences and humanities and really saying some of that needs fixing, and we're, we're infusing that into our humanities and social sciences. We'll never cut it. We get, we get told our psychology department is too big. We have a 1,000 psychology majors. I will never cut psychology. That pays for engineering. They pay for physics. They pay for the expensive but now low enrollment. And it's a balance. And when I tell that to legislators and businessmen and women, they say, oh. I say, so you're going to tell me you want me to cut one of my money-making um, programs for one that does it, and there's no enrollment, and there are no jobs? And they say, no, no. I say, OK, off my case. I don't say it quite that bluntly. <laughs> that's how we're handling it. We're, we're kind of waiting, but we're taking the good parts and picking them out. And we're, we've got our arms wrapped around the social sciences and the humanities. One more. One more. Maybe not. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming. Thank you.